Can I ask you a question before we start? Of course. I was reading back in, in uh, on 22 b about the Talmud that came in front of Rabbi Yeshua. Yes. And he's telling him about how, what Beit Shammai is thinking. Yeah. The last, the last few words I didn't understand. That okay. Point. When he asked, when he asked the Amaretz about his vessel, and, he, and so he told no. him, he told him that it's not kosher. He didn't ask the Amaretz. He's asking. No, no, he told him, yeah. No, no. The way this Talmud is speaking to Rabbi Yeshua is, you know how you try to lead somebody to their own answer. You say, yeah. "Tell me, is the keli of an Amaretz?" Tommy or Tar? So, so Rabbi Shua answers, it's Tommy. And he kind of, he leads them to the answer himself. So he's not asking the Amaretz. He's asking okay. Rabbi Shua to tell him what the halacha is. What I don't understand is the last few words where he says, if you tell the Amaretz that his vessel is Tommy, he'll tell you mine is kosher, yours is Tommy. In other words, he's going in anger, he's going to say, Kind of like, who are you? <laughs> I don't care what you say. You say mine is Tahar, is Tame, and yours is Tahar. I say mine is Tahar, and yours is Tame. Uh, yeah, that's what I understood, and I didn't understand why he would say that. Yeah. Why he would say that? What he's the, the point he's trying to bring out is that the Amaretz isn't going to listen to you. Uh, okay. And so therefore, you're just going. You're not going to gain anything by telling him that his produce or his earthenware vessels are tummy because that leaves him with no recourse. There's nothing else for him to do other than to yeah, discard yeah. of it. So he says, so what's the point of telling him that? And then when there is something that the Amaretz could actually do, then he won't do it because he's no longer listening to us. So therefore yeah. it's like the idea of picking your battles. You know, you got to choose your battles. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Rabbi, yes. Once he, but once he has to go for um, his ritual, uh, <clears throat> you know, purification. It seems though that is different. Though the Amhar it seems to cooperate then at that point. You know, after three days and the seven days, he sees he's got he's got to do something. He's being told to do something that may be to his benefit, and then he he that's, that changes, doesn't it? Well, there's, there's, there's different things over here. One is with regards to what a person does in his own home. And the other is with regards to what you are trying to do in the Beis Hamikdash. So when we tell him about his hazar, that he has to be sprinkled and so on and so forth, right? Why would he be coming to be, um, to make himself ritually pure? Usually that would take place before somebody wants to partake in anything from the Beis Hamikdash with things we got with regards to Kodesh. So for that, we're going to come along and we're going to say, look, if you want to come to the base of Migdash and you want to partake in Kodesh, then you're going to have to do it properly. And so therefore, um, you know, he'll comply because he doesn't have a choice. Um, but uh, but with regards to with regards to his own personal vessels over there, we try to be a little bit more delicate because if people are going to want to borrow from the Amaretz, right? Yeah. You want him, you you want him to be um, you want him to be immersing his kalim properly into the mikvah, um, those those vessels that are those vessels that are able to, to become tar. I see. Okay. But when it comes okay. to the point is when it comes to the base amigdosh. That's where there's real um, um, supervision and jurisdiction um, from Haverim uh, or the, the, the Chachamim. And there we tell him, look, you want to partake in the Kodesh, you're going to have to do it right. And the way to do it right is you can't start counting the, the three days in front of us. So we know that you've counted three days and then we'll do the sprinkling and then we'll do the second sprinkling. Um, and then when you come along and said, say to us, you've done your immersion properly, we'll believe you. Because 
you won't want to have to go through the whole thing all over again. One other thing, I, I would think that they would try to want to emulate the Chaverim, you know, the uh, Amharits anyway, because, you know, they're trying to attain that, uh, that Madrega, you know, I would think, you know, because that would give them a sense of importance and want to continue uh, being of assistance to the, you know, uh, <clears throat> being able to uh, continue uh, lending their uh, Kaleem to the, uh, you know, well, whatever, I, you know. I think, I think like everything in life, it's always to a degree, you know, so long as it's convenient and it doesn't, you know, make me have to change my whole life, then yes. And if there are certain times where you require me to be a little bit more careful, I could do that. But if you want me to change my whole lifestyle, not necessarily is everybody ready to change their whole lifestyle, especially since they themselves are not coming into contact with Kodesh that often, right? Right. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. No problem. We are holding on the Afkhof base Ahmed base. Before we move on, I just want to ask whether there's anything that anybody has outstanding from the Gemara that we learned over the past few days from the beginning of the third chapter. But uh, if there are no questions with regards to anything we learned yesterday or the day before, then we're going to pick up from the next segment of the Gemara where we analyze the next section of the Mishnah. Okay, we are holding at the um, towards the bottom of Dafchav base Amid base twenty two B. Um, we're holding by Achorayim um, Metayif, right? That's where the second in the, when we talk about the differences between the extra stringencies we have by Kodesh, which we don't have by. At Truma, we said with regards to a vessel that has different parts, it has the inside and it has the outside and it has um, the handle. So we say with regards to Kodesh, if you touch any part of the Kali, that makes the entire vessel impure and therefore you're going to have to immerse it. However, if it's talking about Truma, then we say if you immerse, if you if you touch one part, it doesn't make another part of the vessel, um, it doesn't make another part of the vessel impure. So says the Gemara, Maya what does the Mishnah mean when it says the outside and the inside? So we bring a Mishnah. Now, like it says in the Mishnah, Lish and Nitma of Bamashkin, the vessels outside. Contracted Tuma through coming into contact with what? With Mashkin. Now, it's important to note that a Kali cannot become Tame through Mashkin when it comes to biblical Tuma. It's only Midrabanon. And the reason why the Rabbanon made a special decree with regards to a Kali becoming uh, tame when it comes to liquids is because, in fact, there is one case where a certain type of liquid can make a keli tame, and that is when if you have a zav, and we say a zav is an avatuma, right? And he is able to make a rishon tuma. So we say the spit that comes out, the spittle that comes out of the zav or um, any other liquids that leaves his body, if that goes onto a vessel, it can, can contract, it can contract Tuma. That's one case where it can contract Tuma. But because of that one, uh, one instance, the rabbis made an extra stringency to say that a keli can contract Tuma through liquids. So the Mishnah is saying that a kli, that the back of it, meaning the outside of it, <coughs> contracted Tumma B'mashkin, Midra Bonon, Achayrof Tmein, the outside is Tomei, but Toichai, the inside, Oignoi, its rim, 
And that's Rashi explains is there's a little part of a rim that's sticking out at the top, which you could still kind of use to lift or, you know, there's, there's some use for that outside tip that, uh, that kind of curves, o- curves over. The Yodov and its handles, Tahirin, they are all Tahar. Okay, so you've got that. So if something contracts Tuma from a liquid on the outside, then all these other parts remain Tahar. Nit Matoichai, However, if the inside contracted to ma, so then the Mishnah says, Kuloi Tomei, then the entire, the entire vessel becomes tar. So what our Mishnah means when it says, uh, when it says outside and inside and the Sviya, which is the handle, right? These, um, we're saying that with regards to Truma, only if, if it touches one part, then only that part becomes Tomei, and not the other parts. Whereas with regards to Kodesh, we say all parts become, become Tommy. The Mishnah then goes on to say another stringency about Kodesh over Shurma. That is, Obeisat Svita, we talk about, it, well, this was still the, 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 the one that we were mentioning before, that when you have the, the inside, the outside, and the handle. So we want to know what is this Besat Svita that we mentioned, that if you touch this Besat Svita, it's only that part that becomes Tabe and not the other parts of the Kali. Frank the Gemara, my base, Besat Svita, what is the Svita place? The Southern Zemachlaikas. Om Rav Yehuda, Om Shmuel, Rav Yehuda says the name of Shmuel, it's Mokim Shitsevtai, it's a place by which one hands over the vessel to somebody else. So there's some kind of part that uh, that is additional to the actual vessel itself, which people use to hand over the vessel to somebody else, some kind of a handle. The Chain Huimen and similarly says in, in the Pasuk in uh, I think this is in Rus. Is it in Rus? Yeah, it's in Rus. It says Vayitz Patla Kali and he handed her the, the parched grain, which is um Showing us that this idea of a savat is the idea of a handle. So that's what this this besat uh, svita is. But there's a machlekes. Rabbi Asi, Amr Rabbi Yechanan, uh, Rabbi Asi holds the name, says the name of Rabbi Yechanan. No, this besat svita was something else. It was makim shniki hadas save in. It's a place where the people who are uh, like more. Uh, careful with uh, more particular, they were like istanists, they were very particular about the cleanliness. So, this is where they would take and dip their uh, food into um, things like mustard or garlic. Um, so, they would have like a dish, right? And the dish would have a extra small uh, thing attached to it where people would put these um, dips so that they could put these dips into they could dip their food into these into these dips because other people would just use their cups um for mustard and other things and then they would empty the cup and then they would drink um when they when it came time to drink they would just drink from the cup but these and the kiyadas these people would prefer not to use their cups for anything but drink and they would use this place called the uh the besat svita to dip their to 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 dip their food into okay now Tony Rabbi Viva came to Rav Nachman. Rabbi taught the following verse in the presence of Rav Nachman, and he says as follows: Call Hakelim, Ein Lahem Acharayim Toich. All vessels have no distinction between the outside and the inside. Echod Kodesh Hamikdash, whether with regards to holy things of the temple, meaning Kodesh, Mechad Kodesh Agvul, or with regards to thing, the holy things of the borders. Now, what does that mean? Meaning things that are outside of the base of Mingdash. Now, we want to try and figure out what kind of things are you talking about that are considered to be Kodesh that are outside of the base of Mingdash. L'chaira, seemingly, it would make most sense to say that we're talking about Truma, because Truma is holy, even though it can be eaten outside of the base of However, the problem we're going to have is if you say that, then that, that doesn't work with our Mishnah, which says specifically that this idea of there being no difference between an inside and outside of a vessel is only with regards to Kodesh, not with regards 
to Truma. So, Frank the Gemara, Amalei, sort of Nakma said to the Bibi, Koche Gvul, Maininhu, what are the holy things of Gvul, <laughs> meaning outside of the base of English that you refer, that, that are mentioned here in the Brysa? Are you saying Truma? Are you saying that it's referring to Truma and that for Truma there's no difference between the inside of the Kaili and the outside of the Kaili? Didn't we learn in our Mishnah that with regards to the inside and the outside and the Mesatsvita, with regards to Truma, we say that what? That there is a difference between them. And if you touch one, it doesn't make the rest of them Tame. So we cannot say that it's Truma. So we've got to come up with something else. So maybe Dilma, perhaps, when it says, that this is <laughs> that is in the base of Migdash, and also Kedesh, that is in the that, that is um Kotshe Hagvul, which means outside the base of Migdash. Maybe this is referring to Lechulin Shinasu Altar Kedesh. Maybe it's referring to regular food. However, it was prepared with the stringencies of the level of Tahara that is used for that 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 we apply to Kedesh. Maybe that's what that's maybe that's what you're what, what, what you're talking about. So he answers at Karton Nilsa the Omar Rabba Bavuha. You've just reminded me by saying this, you've just reminded me of the statement of Rabba Bavuha, which we mentioned before. That what Rabba Bavuha says. In this Mishnah, we have 11 extra stringencies with regards to Kodesh and not for Trumot. And what do we say about the about these different stringencies? We say, the first six ones are Bein L'Kodesh, is apply both to Kodesh, Bein L'Chulun Shinas Atar Kodesh. And also, they apply to the Chulun that was prepared with the level of Tara of Kodesh. However, the last few of the Mishnah, those few extra stringencies, is only the Kodesh. We apply them only to Kodesh. That were made and therefore it makes a lot of sense and it fits perfectly that when it says that there's no difference between the inside and the outside, whether it's for Kodshe HaMikdash or Kodshe HaGvul, the things that are Kodesh. In the base of Migdosh, or things that are considered Kodesh outside of the base of Migdosh, it must be referring to what the Chulun that are not that are made that are prepared on the level of Tara on the standard of Kodesh. Okay, the next shtikel of the Gemara goes as follows. We mentioned in the Mishnah, Hanoi says a Midras, if somebody who is carrying a Midras, yeah, Noi says a Truma. With regards to Truma, he can carry Truma. Avaloy is a Kodesh, but not Kodesh. Now, let's understand the situation over here. It seems that what's going on is you have a guy who he himself is a Zav. Now, a Zav carrying a barrel of wine, right, that is Truma, must be that it's an earthenware barrel. Why? Because if it's an earthenware barrel, then we know the outside doesn't become tome by being touched by this zav, because an earthenware vessel doesn't become an earthenware vessel doesn't become tome from the outside. It only becomes tome from the inside. So what we're saying is that if this guy is carrying a barrel of wine in one hand, and in his other hand, he's carrying, let's say, his shoe, right? So we say, for Truma, we're not concerned, and he can continue carrying it, and there's no problem. However, we say that's not the case when it comes to Kodesh. We're worried with regards to Kodesh, and so therefore we say, with Kodesh, we don't allow it. Frank the Gemara, Kodesh, my time alone. If you're concerned for Kodesh, in other words, since you're not concerned for Truma, because ostensibly this is an earthenware barrel, and since it's an earthenware barrel, it's not going to become Tomei. If it's not going to become Tomei for Truma, it's certainly not going to become Tomei for Kaidish as well. 
because, as we said, an earthenware barrel does not become tummy from the outside. So then the question is, so why do we make this special decree with regards to Kodesh, an extra stringency? Because it was a story, <laughs> there are a lot of different enactments that were made by the rabbis because because of stories that happens there was an incident and something went wrong and as a result the rabbi said okay that's it we now know if for all future cases we don't want this to happen ever again we're making a new enactment so it's usually a story that happens and that causes it and what we're going to see over here is there's a dispute between the rabbis whether or not when the rabbis made a particular enactment, a particular decree, because of a story that happened, does it apply broadly, or does it have to be rigidly following the exact scenario that took place for which the rabbis made a decree, right? In other words, if the story is slightly different, would we say that the rabbis didn't make the decree in that case? It was only if the story is exactly the same. So let's look at let, let, Let's see what the Gemara says. Because of a Maisa Shoya, what happened? The Omer of Yehuda Meshmul, Yehuda said the name Shmuel, Maisa Be'echo, there was a story with a guy. Soon, the Gemara is going to tell us a, a, exactly what, what, what was going on. But we'll just follow what it says at the moment. There was a story with a guy. Uh, oh, sorry, this, this case is explicit now. Okay. So, there was an instant about a guy who was transporting a barrel of wine, which was consecrated to be used for Kodesh, and he was moving it from place to place. And what happened as he was walking, the strap of his sandal broke off. Now remember, this guy is a Zov, okay? This guy is a Zov, and he's carrying a barrel of wine, and he was fine. He was fine. <clears throat> he was fine to carry the, the barrel, but all of a sudden, one of the uh, the, the the straps of his sandal broke off. So what did he do? On a tall law, so he took it, and he put it on top of the barrel so that he could continue walking. Right? He he didn't want you know he didn't want to carry it with his hand, so he put it on top of he he put it on top of the barrel. And what happened? Now the strap fell into the airspace of the barrel. Now the nitmes, now the whole thing contracted to more. So as a result, by Shah Amru at that time, the rabbis came out and said, Anoises a midras, somebody who is carrying a midras, like this this uh, this strap of his sandal, which was a midras, because again he was wearing it, right? So that made it a midras. Noise as a truma, he can carry the truma of a but he cannot carry the kodesh. So the Gemara asks, with regards to the story, Ihochi, if this stringency was decreed because of an actual incident, so therefore this has got to be a real concern. And if it's a real concern, so Truma Nami, then the, then the Truma should also, the restriction should apply to Truma as well, right? And for the Gemara, Hamani, who's the title of this Mishnah, who says that um, the decree was only for Kodesh and not for Truma. Reb Hanani ben Akiva Akavya he. The title of the Mishnah is Reb Hanani ben Akavya. Toma, because he says with regards to similar, a similar situation, and when I said before, the Gemara is going to explain the story soon, that it's over here that I meant that this, this following story isn't clear straight away, but it becomes a little bit more clearer later on. So we'll just mention what it says over here, that the story is like this. So he says, with, he said, this guy, Rebchanani ben Akavya, said with regards to a similar story, that like, the rabbis only prohibited transporting and the the mechatos or the the afer of the chatos, right, from transporting it uh, in any way other than on the ground, um, the only time they made this restriction was with regards to transporting it across the Yarden and with regards to using a boat, right? But no other way. 
and that restriction that they made was exactly how the incident took place for which they made the decree. Okay, so he's saying similarly in our mission. So the Gemara is saying, just like Rabbi Hanani ben Akavia said with regards to the story of the guy who transported the Mechatos and the Eifrechatos um, on a boat and something happened. And as a result of what happened, they made a decree and the decree only applies to transporting it on a ship. And it only applies to the Jordan the Jordan River, so too we say over here, when the rabbis made the decree because of the instance of the guy who was carrying the barrel and the strap uh, um, broke and he put it on top of the barrel and then it made that barrel of wine uh, contract Tuma because the instant took place with Kodesh and not Truma, therefore the decree of the rabbis is only with regards to Kodesh and not with Truma. Yes. Yeah, I think that the thing with uh, the boat on the Oregon, I think what it was is uh, when the boat landed, uh, they found that there was a human bone uh, wedged into the boat, which which made stuff time there. Right, that's correct. That's correct. We're, 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 com we're coming to that soon. Yes. Fred Ingemara, Mahi. What's the case for which Rem Khalani ben Akavya made his statement? The time because it was thrown in the Bryce of a person should not take khatas water or khatas ashes. These were uh, the things that were spring water that was used in order to be able to make the mixture and the and and the ashes of the of the animal that were made to make this mixture to be able to sprinkle on people. So he says, you're not allowed to take take this water or this ashes and transport them across the, the Jordan in a boat. Nor should he stand on one side of the river and throw them across to the other side of the river. Nor should he float them across the water. Nor should he ride upon an animal or upon his friend. Unless his feet were touching the ground. Aval. However, Mavirin al Gabe Hagesha Veinakhoshesh. You're allowed to bring them over a bridge, and you don't need to be concerned that you're violating the decree, even though the Gesher is in a way, this 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 bridge is in a way not on the ground, but nevertheless, it's 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 connected to the ground, and so therefore you, your feet are still on the ground uh, when you're walking on the bridge. So that's fine. Now we say this rule applies whether it's on the, the Jordan River or any other river. That is the opinion of the Tanakama. So we came along and we said all these different restrictions surrounding this original story, right? We say that although the story was with a guy in a boat, um, in a boat crossing the Jordan River, Nevertheless, we came along and said that you should never pass it over, you should never um, float it over, send it over in any other way unless the feet are on the ground. And it's not just the Jordan River, but it's any river. That's where the, that's the opinion of the Tanakama. But here comes Reb Hanania ben Akavya, and he disagrees. Reb Hanania ben Akavya, like, when the rabbis made a, the decree, the only decree they made um, about. Uh, transporting khatas water or, or, or ashes um, through a means of non-ground transportation, it was only with regards to um, not sending it on a ship, and it's only with regards to the Yarden. Okay, and th which is how the incident actually took place. What was the story, the incident that actually occurred? The Omer, Rabbi Huda Omer Av says, this was the story there was a story about a certain person. He was transporting the chatos water and the chatos ashes over the over the Jordan, and he was in a boat. Now, they found an olive-sized piece. 
which was found lodged into the floor of the boat. And as a result, this made the May Chatos and the May and the May Afer contract this tumor. But Isa Shah Amru at that time the Chacham made a decree, La Yisa Ad the Mechatas by Efe Pora, Biyavirim Biyadin Besvina. That at that time the Rabbis made a decree that no person should take the Chatas waters or the ashes and transport them across the Jordan in a boat because they didn't want this to happen again. So now we say that this Tana. Okay. Yes. Jordan doesn't make sense to me because what if the boat is not crossing the Jordan? Is what, what if he's carrying it on a boat on another river or, or, or in the sea? So sometimes it seems that when something goes wrong, even though it's not an ordinary occurrence. We don't expect this to happen every time. I mean, how many times are you going to get onto a boat and find a bone of a human corpse stuck yeah. in the bottom on the bottom floor? Nevertheless, the rabbi said, look, if this happened in this incident, so therefore this is maybe a sign from heaven or whatever it might be, that we need to be more careful. So what are we going to do to be more careful? What we'll do is we will make a xera that... This shouldn't happen again in this particular in this very same circumstance. So from now on, you're not allowed to take these ashes or this water across the Jordan River on a boat. This way, we're showing that we're taking this instance seriously and trying to prevent that it should ever it should never happen again. I mean, look, we we, we but we, next I, time there might not be a bone there. Right. No, I understand. I understand that. But they're saying we're we're making extra precaut taking extra precautionary measures to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again but mm -hmm. but they don't want they don't want to come along according to him <clears throat> according to him they didn't want to uh, broaden this and to make these restrictions sweeping restrictions they made them very very particular that just in the same instance um, the same circumstances, if they were to arise again, one shouldn't do it in that manner. Don't take these ashes across the Jordan in a boat. That's it. So okay. we're saying, likewise, he is of the opinion that when we say that there was a story about a guy carrying a barrel and he t his strap broke and he put it on top and it fell in. So the rabbi said, we don't want that happening again. And so therefore... They said with regards to Kodesh, with regards to Kodesh, one should not, uh, one should not carry a midras in one hand and carry a barrel of wine in another hand. So now the rabbis have a bunch of questions with regards to this statement. He says, if this is so, right, that this is the gazera that the Chachamim made, that you cannot carry it with regards to Kodesh, right? In other words, let's let, let's take let's take the scenario. A guy is a zov. He's about to carry a barrel of wine of kodesh, and we say you cannot carry something that's a midras, right, in one hand and the barrel in another hand. Why? Because of a story that happened that the guy took it and put it on top of the barrel and it fell inside. Fine. He boiled who? So the Gemara we moved over. Yeah. <clears throat> So the, so the Gemara and, uh, and they asked they asked him sandal tome right with regards to what the Mishnah forbids it's when a guy is carrying a a a, a sandal which is tome right so we say when you're carrying a sandal that is tome together with a barrel of wine you can't do it together because of a wine you're going to put the sandal tome into the barrel of wine accidentally, and it's going to become, it's going to become Tommy. However, what happens if I myself, right? I am Tahar. I'm not a Zav. I'm Tahar. And, right? And I want to carry my sandal. And my sandal is also Tahar. So the question is, sandal Tahar Mahu. What is the law with regard to carrying Kodesh together with a sandal that is Tahar? In other words, there's, a, there's, a, there's this principle of sometimes making a decree not to do something in a permissible manner because you might come to do it in an impermissible manner. In other words, 
I don't, maybe the rabbis would go as far as to say, when you're carrying a barrel of wine, which is kodesh, right? Don't carry any sandals while you're doing that, even if it's tar. Why? Because if you're going to, if I'm going to let you can carry a sandal, which is tar, you might come to carry a sandal, which is tame. And then you're going to violate the, the, the decree that we made that one shouldn't do that. So the Gemara doesn't answer that question. The next question they ask is, Chavis Pesucha, obviously, when the Mishnah says you cannot carry this barrel of uh, Kodesh wine, it's going to be talking about a barrel which is uh, which is open, or this, like there's at least some opening on the top. I'm assuming that the guy who was carrying the barrel of wine uh, didn't take his strap of his sandal and try to, you know, balance it on, on the tip. Yes. Ezra. But Rabbi, you, you, you just said that this decree was made specifically because of this situation. Yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. so it, to me, it's obvious that if it's a Sandal Tahor, uh, the reason why I didn't answer is because it's an obvious response. So there's no need for an answer. So if it's Tahor, you can, you can still carry it. It's not a problem. It's only in the case where it's Tame that it's a problem. Well, according to what the Gemara, according to what the Gemara um, explained to us, is that the specific, um, I guess, um, example is Tahar, excuse me, is Kodesh versus Truma. But the question is, once the rabbis did make that decree that do not carry, um, do not carry a Midras, right, meaning a sandal, that is uh, belongs to a Zal, right? Together with Kodesh, did they say, don't carry a sandal um, that is that is a Midras only? Or did they come along and say, don't carry any, any sandal? Uh, look, I hear what you're saying, and what you're saying makes sense. But nevertheless, if, if the Gemara asks the question, it must mean that, uh, that, that there, was a, there was a reason for asking it. I mean, one second, I just want to see something. Uh, sandal yeah, sandal hey, if you look in Rashi, sandal tor mai mi goes a sandal tor otu tome eloi. Do they make a decree? Um, otu, but you're what you're saying is that I understand what you're saying that because we say that with regards to a decree that they made, they it's only it's only in a time. Um, it's only specific to the case and the incident that took place that they made the decree. So obviously, it must have been um, it must have been a case where um, where the, the the sandal was tame. So they that's the only time that they made the decree. However, I don't know. Uh, you're saying the reason they didn't answer it is because uh, you're saying the reason they didn't answer it is because the answer is obvious. It's an obvious. It's an obvious response. So, but the, so then, if, if it's so obvious, why ask the question? It's not the same circumstance. No, I, I understand. That's what that's what I was saying. It's not. You're right. It's not the same. It's not the same circumstance, and so it shouldn't even be a question. Because even if a, even if the strap of the sandal falls into the opening, because it's tahar, it doesn't do anything to what's inside the the the. Right, no, that's correct. That's correct. The, the the question the question is with regards to as Rashi explains. The question is whether we apply this idea of gzera otu that even though there's no problem, but because we don't want you to ever come along and um, and violate this new decree that we made, we say, look, just don't carry anything together with Kodesh. In other words, do we say that the specifics only relate to the fact that it was Kodesh and not Truma, or do we say that it, it applies to even the more finer detail of the fact that you were carrying, he was carrying something Tomei, um, and um, and then we wouldn't apply um, the, the stringency with regards to carrying something Tar. Anyway, the Gwan doesn't answer. But I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Not sure. I'm not sure. 
the next so the, the next question the next question is with regards to a chavis, a barrel. So the Mishnah says that with regards to a barrel, right, you're not allowed to carry this midras, right? Uh, this midras um, sandal, sandal, right? Um, because obviously the barrel is open. But chavis stuma mahu. What would be the law with regards to a barrel that was completely closed? If it was completely closed, in which case um, you would not be able to reenact what took place in the original instance, because obviously it could never fall in because it's closed, right? So do we also say that, well, because if I let you take an open barrel, a closed barrel, you may come along and make the mistake and then eventually come to carry and to carry a open but an open barrel therefore we make a decree or not the more doesn't answer this question either but now the third one we do answer and that is we ask the question now what is the halacha if you didn't listen to the rabbis of our venosa mahu if i came along and i was carrying a barrel and i was carrying in my other hand i was carrying a I was carrying a midras, right? And now the truth is that because it's an earthenware vessel, so there's no problem. I cannot make it. Uh, I cannot make it contract tuma from the outside. And I didn't make the same mistake as the original guy. I didn't put the sandal on top of the barrel. I kept them separate. So what's the halacha? Is this barrel of Kodesh still tar, or does it become tame because you violated what the rabbi said? So, Rabbi Law Omar Rabbi Law says, Im Ava if he went up, if he transgressed the rabbi's decrees and he went and he carried tame, this now becomes tame, the barrel becomes tame. But Rabbi Zaira Omar Rabbi Zaira says, Ava Venosa, if with the Eved, once you already did it. So we say tahor. It still remains tahor. You shouldn't have done it. Um, but if you were careful and uh, the sandal never um, came into contact with the inside of the barrel, then we say that it's uh, it's tahor. And okay. That's the, and that's the ruling. And that's the ruling. Yeah. So now, now we come to the sixth case of the Mishnah. We skip over the the case of the knots because we've already discussed them with the first issue uh, with when we mentioned the vessels inside of the vessel so we move to the next one and that is we say with regards to kodesh there's an extra stringency over truma and that is if vessels kalim hanig morim b'tahara if vessels were completed in a state of tahara then we say for kodesh you've got to immerse them um but for truma you don't Break the Gemara. The Gemara says, like, ask, ask as follows. We want to understand the particulars of the situation. What happened over here? The Gamrina man, who's the guy who manufactures this vessel and completes the process of making it? In Lema, if you're going to say, the Gamrin who, Chaver, the Chaver was the one who's manufacturing these things. And he's the one that completed them. So, Lamalo Tvila, even by Kodesh, why do you need to have immersion surely this guy who's the cover is going to be very careful that they shouldn't come into into contact with uh, any tuma after completion and so the, after the, they've been completed so therefore um before they became completed there was no possibility for them to become tummy ella so what do you have to say it can't be a cover it's got to be the gamrino amaretz it must be the amaretz um was uh, completed this uh, making the manufacturing of this vessel. Now, if that's the case, nigmar is this is is, is this what the Tana is going to call completing it in the state of tahara? Of course not, because if he's an amaretz, then we assume that anything that the amaretz touches is tummy. So this is not called completing the creation of the kli b'tahara. So, what do we have to say? So Rav Bashila said the name of Rav Masna in the name of Shmuel as follows. The truth is the Gamrino Chaver. Who completed the production? This was a Chaver. 
but we make a special stringency mishum sinayra da amaretz because that of the spittle of an amaretz, which means like this. Let's imagine I have um, a, a chaver, a chaver who's making um, uh, he's making a vessel. And he has a really good friend who's an Amaretz. He has a really good friend who's an Amaretz. And he says, come here, I want to show you what I'm making. I haven't finished making it, so come and look at it. And while they're talking, so the Amaretz is speaking <laughs> and spraying. You know, sometimes we say, listen, I want the news, not the weather, right? <laughs> so he was uh, spraying as he was talking. And some of that spittle, right, went on. This Some of the spittle went on to the Kaili. So that's what I'm worried about. That's what I'm worried about. I'm not worried about the Chavar. I'm worried that the Chavar might have a friend who's a Lama Aris that may come and he might, uh, some of his spit might, might come onto this Kaili. And that's why we make this extra stringency with regards to Kodesh. Frank the Gemara, one second. The Nafal Amos, when you're worried about the spittle falling on the Kaili, when, when did it fall? At what point did it fall? If you're saying that this fell when? Before you finished making the vessel, before you completed it, it's not a vessel at that time. So therefore it doesn't become it doesn't contract too much. So why are we concerned? We shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to immerse it. Even if this did happen, you'll still be fine. Ella, rather, what are you gonna have to say? Boss of the Gamre. It's gonna have to be after the Chavar completed it. But Frank the Gemara. A hover is never going to let this Amaret anywhere near the vessel once he's completed it because he's going to be careful to make sure that it shouldn't become Tome. Misa Zarbu, isn't he, the, 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 the hover, he's certainly going to be very careful with it and keep them away from any source of Tome, including this Amaret. So what kind of scenario are we talking about in the Mishnah that would require you to immerse it? Le'olam, and for the Gemara. So the Gemara adds, Le'olam really, Mikame the Gamre. It's really before he completed. And that's why he doesn't mind the Amaretz coming nearby and talking to him. The Dilma, and it's possible, Be'idna the Gamre, Adayin Lachahir, while it has come into completion after the Amaretz has already left. Right, but some of his spittle remained moist, and since it remained moist after the completion, so therefore it can now make the keli tome, and therefore because we're worried about this particular um, scenario, that's why we say with regards to kodesh, you need to immerse it. You need to you need to immerse it into into the mikvah. Okay, so now. This is like the story we had with the two women, right? Rabbi, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but what if the Kaelin, it is not completed yet, and he and, and, and his spittle gets onto this thing, and he's completing, and it's still being made, it, even to immerse it in the mikveh may, may not be enough because it's inside the content of the Kaelin it, while it's being processed. So right. what happens what, then? What we're saying, what we're, what we're, what we're, what we're Let me let me understand let me understand what you're saying. What you're saying is even with the Gzera of the Chachamim, that if a person came along and all of this even if it didn't happen, but let's say we're assuming that just in case it happened, we're telling you to immerse it into the mikvah, maybe the mikvah won't help because the spittle might still be there. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it might be in the content of the kaolin. In, in other words, if it, if it wasn't processed yet and he's and he spit on, and then it, it hardens and his spit is inside the the the, okay. the, the the content of it, do you understand? Yeah. So the halacha is the halacha material, is, the material. Right. So the, the halacha is that it's only um, moist spittle that is metame. Once it dries, it no longer is metame. So when a when a person comes along and he wants to take his um, his vessel and he wants to use it for kodesh, what he's going to do is he's going to inspect the he's going to inspect the vessel and he's going to make sure that it's completely dry and clean before he immerses it into the mikvah. And so, therefore, you won't have that chashash that you're speaking of, where a person uh, might might uh, you might you won't have that chashash. That, uh, that there's still something left over because you've cleaned it properly before immersing it into the mikvah. 
we're we're just saying that we're concerned that the Kaylee did become Tommy even after you completed it, even though you've been protecting it from the time it became uh, complete. But maybe there was some spittle that was still moist right after you finished making it from the guy who was speaking to you before. So, so let me understand this. You are making a kli. Yes. The kli is not complete. Correct. You call your friend over. He comes and he's and he's talking to you and accidentally he may, he spits onto this thing while it's still not complete. Correct. Okay. At that point, because it's not complete, and it's not a uh, therefore there's no tumor being transmitted. That's correct. So you're saying that as long as let's say that drop or whatever it is is on the kli. While you are, uh, uh, and then you complete it, then that drop automatically activates the tuma yes. on the kli. But you have to have, I mean, the point here is that you have to have in mind that the kli is complete. Well, once it becomes complete, it becomes complete on its own. Once you finish making a copy. There, there, are, some, there are some klis that, that, you know, don't, uh, you know, you don't have to complete that to be considered to be complete. Whereas there are others that you do, you have to have in mind that they are complete. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so let's so go now, with that. So what you're saying is that that thing, as long as it's on the, uh, on the CLE, as soon as you complete it, activates. That's even correct. Though it even though it, it, it happened beforehand. It That's correct. As long as it's wet. So long as it's still wet. And we had the same, a, similar, a similar discussion when it came to the woman who was weaving a garment. And she didn't realize that she, she had, uh, she had uh, fixed the knot with her mouth, right, um, while she was still Anita. But it was before it became, before it became, um, it, before it became a garment, more than three by three, three fingers by three fingers, and uh, but it was still wet, and as a result of that, it became tummy. Once it was bigger than three, three by three, it's the same. It's the same principle. Okay. So now, what did we say? What did we say in the Mishnah? We said that if. If this did happen, right? If a person, um, it, sorry, when a person finishes making a vessel, okay, finished person, a person finishes making a vessel. I need you to to, to concentrate now because this is this is a bit complicated. <clears throat> when a person finished com completing a a vessel, we say that the Mishnah tells us he's got to immerse it into the mikvah before use, okay? So from the exactness of the Mishnah, from the, we saying that tefillah in haraf shemesh loy, that the rabbis, with regards to this vessel, required for you to be able to use this and immersion into the mikvah. However, when it comes to haraf shemesh, meaning waiting for the sun to set in order for you to complete the process of the purification, that they did not require. Rather, you can use it immediately while it has been immersed on that day. We call that a tful yoy. So it, depending on what kind of tumma a person contracts and, um, and what kind of rules we apply, sometimes there will be a state where you can use something even though you haven't waited until the night. And in most cases, you have to wait until the night. So are, are, are we saying that with regards to this vessel that's going to be used for Kaidesh, when the rabbis say you have to immerse it into the mikvah, then you can, then it's only the mikvah that's holding it back from becoming pure, but not waiting for the sun to set. So if that's what's implied from our Mishnah, so then must nisin to like Rebeliezer. Our Mishnah is then not going to go in accordance with the view of Rebeliezer. Okay, you're going to have to. Well, yes, put on your seat. Another question. Yeah. I thought 
that if something was manufactured by a Jew, you don't have to immerse it. Only if it was manufactured in a factory that is not Jewish. Right, but we're not talking about we're not talking about immersing it into the mikvah for the purpose of elevating it to the sanctity to, to a level that a Jew can use it. We're talking about from pure from impurity to purity. This is oh. about Tuma Tahara. This is a whole different story. So okay. we're gonna say we're gonna say now that what you're implying that with regards to this rabbinic enactment that we said that you have to go and immerse it into the mikvah, then it's only the mikvah that holds it back from becoming pure, but not waiting till the night. This would not accord with the opinion of Rebbe Leza, who we're going to try and show right now, holds that you do have to wait until the nightfall for vessels that are being completed in a state of tahara. Right? So... Now let's go and try and show this. If you have a reed tube that one cut for putting chatos ash in it, so in other words, some kind of receptacle that you're going to make out of this reed, right? Um, once you cut it, um, we're saying with regards to this, Rebbe Leza says, you immerse it immediately. Rabbi Shua, amen. Rabbi Shua says, No, first you need to make it tame, and then you need to immerse it. In other words, like this. It's a very complicated process to do anything with regards to the Pura Aduma. There's a, the way you prepare things are very particular. And there were certain things that there was a dispute between the rabbis and the tzedukim. And one of the questions, one of the one of the disputes was whether it can be used straight away or whether or not, or whether it has to wait till the end of the day. The rabbis held it can be used straight away. The tzedukim held that it has to be, the, the, the tzedukim held that it has to, it has to have harav shemesh. So one of the things that the chachamim would do in order to show that there's a distinction between what they're doing and the view of the tzedukim is sometimes they would take something and they would make it tummy by putting a sheritz upon it, right? And then we would know as a result of that that any um, particular um, action that was done was done with consideration for the fact that it is now actually tummy, okay? So there's a discussion with regards to this read. Uh, do we first make it tame and then immerse it to dispel any connection or any notion of agreeing with the tzedukim or can you just take it as it is and immerse it in and then use it straight away and th and that would be the distinction so now <clears throat> we ask with regards to um with with this mishnah the chatocha man who was the guy who cut the reed if you're going to say the, that the guy who cut it was a chaver why do you need to immerse it all together it, 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 it wasn't susceptible to become tame uh, to begin with and when it did become susceptible to be tame it was the chaver who was dealing with it so why do you need to have an immersion altogether the so we're going to say you have to say that it was actually an amoritz that cut it okay so now but Baha, if that would be the case, then Rabbi Yeshua should say in this case, right, that first you should make it tame and then immerse it. But it's oh, it's already tame because of the Amaretz. So why did Rabbi why would Rabbi Yeshua in our Mishnah in, in the quote in the case that we quoted why would Rabbi Yeshua who argues with Rabbi Yesa, why would he say you have to make it tame first and then immerse it? It's already tame. In other words, if we're saying it's the Amaretz who's cutting it, right? Then it's already tame. So rather. So you're gonna to have to say Amr Ab Shmuel Barshila Amr of Mas Amr Shmuel that La Ilah the Khatcha Khaver. That really the story was that it was the Khaver who cut it. Um Shum Tsinar the Amaretz, and like we said before, right? The same thing over here, that it, we're worried about the spittle of the Amaretz, right? And that's why, and, and because of that, and because of that, it requires to have an immersion, right? So now, 
Do not fall, Amos. When did it fall? If it's going to say that the spittle fell before, before uh, you cut it, it's not a vessel, so therefore it doesn't become tummy. The Elo, rather, it's got to be what? It's got to be after after you cut it. But then if it's after you cut it, he isn't he careful. So therefore, we're going to go, it's, it's, it's almost a repeat. Rather, we're going to have to say that what? It's happened before you cut it, right? Right? And that's when the spittle may have, may have, may have come onto the reed. But perhaps while, while it is, while you cut it, or after you cut it, it's still um, moist. And therefore, and therefore, what's going to happen? You have Rebbe Liezer saying that you um, that that you immerse it, and according to Rebbe Yeshua, you have to make it tummy and then immerse it. So now, Bishlem with Rebbe Yeshua, everything works well with Yeshua, who says that the tube is first rendered tame and only then immersed. Hainu the Ikehekera letzitukin. That's how he makes a hacker between what you're doing and the tzedukim. Remember. Just think about this for a second. We want to make sure that nobody thinks that we are following the procedures of the tzedukim. So therefore, Rabbi Yeshua says, we take this, um, we take this, um, we take this reed and we make it tome. We make it tome. And that makes a hacker between us and the tzedukim. However, according to Rabbi Yeza, right? One second before we go before we go before we uh, deal with the the, the, uh, the view of Rebbe Leza, um we're going to show how this is actually required that we have to make a hacker between uh, make a, a distinction and a differentiation between the way we proceed uh, to do things and the tzedukim do that the tanana is stored in Rabbi? a yes I, I'm sorry I don't mean to interrupt it almost seems like you have to use reverse psychology in order to get the approval of the Sidukum, you know because you know they are they were they were trying to do the opposite you have the absolutes if you know what I'm saying you know to try to convince them that we it, have to it, do things correct but, it, 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 but here it, the concern the, here the concern isn't to to con convince the Sidukim, it's to make sure that the people who are onlookers who are watching never assume that we agree with the tzedukim in, a, in an instance where we actually don't agree. The Tanan, like it's told in the Mishnah, they would purposely make Tommy the Kayan <laughs> who was to burn the Paraduma, in order to discredit the opinion of the Tzedukim Shoyo that they used to say, that they used to say that the service of the Paraduma could be performed by Kayanim who had become Tomei only if they had experienced nightfall. Right? So now, according to Rabbi Shua, it's understandable how you take this cut tube and you um, and using it before nightfall serves to repudiate the Sadducees because he says you first have to purposely make it tome, right, by taking a sheret or something and making it tome, and then you immerse it, and then you use it before nightfall. Before nightfall. Ella on Rabbi Lezer, but according to Rabbi Lezer, who says that what? That the tube was not deliberately contaminated, right? But it was only in order to make it tar from the tuma of what we say um, in our Mishnah, that vessels that are completed in the state of Tahara, so then how, how does he use this to, in, how does he repudiate the view of the Tzedukim? Because it's not really Tame. I am Bishlema, Bishlema, Inan Harshemesh. It's all good to say that if you say that according to Rebbe ordinarily we require the passage of nightfall after the immersion for vessels completed in Tara to become Tome. I know the Ike Keralis Dukin, then that would be the Hekera. However, because we at the beginning of this whole discussion said that the implication from our Mishnah is that it doesn't require Arab Shemesh, right? So therefore, so therefore, 
how would you how would you come along and make a differentiation between the view of the tzedukim and our view in the in, in the view of Rebbe Leza? Allah, he amrit by Alma, like in Har If you're going to say that in general you don't need Har Shevish, my hacker, let's tzedukim ika. What kind of hacker? What kind of uh, distinction, differentiation? Um, do you have to demonstrate that we repudiate the view of the Sadducee? So we're trying to therefore say so that our Mishnah cannot be in accordance with the view of Rebbe Leza. So I have the Gemara, Marav. Rav says that no, the truth is that our our Gemara can uh, our that, that that our Mishnah can actually accord with Rebbe Leza. We'll conclude with this, and this is Asur Kitmei Sheretz. That when the rabbis made the tube cut for the ashes of the paraduma, tuma, right? When they when they said that it's tame, then when they said in that case they make it the to the equivalent of a sheretz, a contaminated object. In which case, with regards to a sher, uh, something that was applied to it, the stringency of the level of a sheretz, then that would serve as a good differentiation between the view of the tzedukim who would say that if you're saying that it has the level of tuma of a sheretz, they would say, well, then you have to wait until the morning. And the Chacham would say, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't, and we're not going to, to show that we, that we repudiate the view of the, of the, of the tzidukim. And I think we'll stop here. And Hashem, we will uh, probably pick up again from the beginning of this, of this sugya um, after Pesach. Um, because uh, we're going to have to refresh our memories. Um, but uh, until then, I wish you all Chag Kosher V'Sameach, Chag Pesach Kosher V'Sameach, and it's a good pleasure learning with all of you. And um, thank you for the schus, what should I tell you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.